the first matter on the agenda is the approval of uh, minutes slash letters. Has uh, everybody had an opportunity to look at the, the minutes and letters? I move to approve the minutes and letters as uh, documented. There's a motion to approve the minutes and letters. I see a second. All right, there's a motion on the table to approve the minutes and the letters. Any discussion? Seeing none, up for a vote. All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. Motion passes. Letters and minutes approved. Um, looks like we go straight into the first request. But if you could read into the record the, uh, the opening statement. If you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Stormwater Management Committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of certiorari with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Thank you. Is the first applicant here? Wonderful. You got all your parties here? Yes. Wonderful. Looks like there's a podium right up there you can go to. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Matt Schlicker. I'm with Kimley Horn and Associates. Uh, also here today are, are Maggie and David Callahan, the owners of the property at uh, 2628 Sugar Tree Road, uh, Mr. Fleming Smith with uh, Smith G Studio, and Mr. Bill Frash, the contractor on the project. Um, on a couple months ago, on June 6th, uh, we were in front of this committee, and, and the committee uh, unanimously approved uh, variance requests related to some disturbance uh, and water quality buffers associated with a renovation and uh, some some additions to an existing home at uh, again at 2628. Uh, there the. Again, the variance was was passed and construction got underway and it was determined that there was no footings around the existing building at all, uh, which is inconsistent with the initial assumptions that were made with the design. Uh, so the owner and architect and contractor got together and decided that the best path forward uh, to ensure the structural stability of, of, the, of the project uh, would be to reconstruct the building and the existing footprint. So we were in communication and coordination with uh, Metro Stormwater staff, and uh, they determined that we uh, we need to come back in front of this committee, uh, given the change in the the initial assumptions and conditions. Um, so so here we are. I think again, the, the key facts are that the uh, the building, the home, is being reconstructed in exactly the same footprint as was initially. Uh, laid out in the initial variance request. Um, the key aspects re related to impacts and mitigation have not changed at all uh, since the initial request. Um, we're still reducing the impervious area and the buffers. Uh, we're still providing additional plantings uh, to enhance the buffer area between the uh, driveway and the house and Sugar Tree Creek. And we're not requesting any you know, additional impacts Impacts, no additional impervious area, uh, no expansion to the footprint, uh, or no additional variances beyond what was original re originally requested. Uh, so we we appreciate the consideration of the re approval of this request, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that may come up regarding the request. Thank you. I messed up and forgot to get a summary of the request from the, from the staff first. So if we could get that real quick, we have to get it all on the record. All right. uh, case number one on the agenda is case number 2019-00007, Callahan Residence, single family residential at 2868 Sugar Tree Road. APN is 117-0900-800. Inspector is Kimberly Hayes. Council District 25, West Fulton. 
case was previously granted approval by Stormwater Management Committee on June 6, 2019, under page 2019-0007, to allow the following. Servants within the water quality buffer, continuous mowing and maintenance of the buffer, and waiver of buffer signage. Request for reappearance. It was determined the foundation of the existing home is not adequate to support the proposed addition. Proposed reconstruction of the home is within the footprint of the existing structure and the additions previously granted under the stormwater appeal. Unforeseen structural conditions of the existing structure prompted the request for reappearance. Applicants request to allow the following. Disturbance within the water quality buffer, continuous mowing maintenance within 75 foot stream buffer area, modification of stream buffer height signage. Signage height. Appellant is Margaret and David Callahan III, represented by Matt Schlicker of Kimley Horn Associates. Comments, stormwater staff, no comment, code said no comment. Planning site is on RS20 deferred to stormwater for review and Greenways defers to the decision of stormwater management. Committee. Thank you. Based on that, any change in your opening? <laughs> uh, no change. That's one, one additional point. Uh, along with the reconstruction, the only change uh, that would be incorporated in that as well is we're raising the finished floor of the building up uh, 1.35 feet or something like that. Uh, that's not, you know, the existing building satisfied all applicable FEMA requirements, but we just thought it was an opportunity since we were um, reconstructing to add a, a bit of additional flood protection, and so that's the only other change from the original request. Now let's open up to the public. Anybody here speak in favor of or against this request? Seeing none, then it comes to the panel for our discussion. The questions, I want to make sure I understand. Why is this in front of us again? What do we, what, 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 what's changed? They're digging a footer. You're dig, you're They're digging, digging the, deeper? You're digging the footer yeah. for the old foundation to be a new foundation. They're tearing down the existing house and building a new one. Okay. That's the only thing that's different. The thought was that it was a new building. New building. Oh, so it's not as much just a little bit of an add-on. It's a, it's a new house. It's actually new. Okay. I've got a motion. All right, let's hear a motion. Move to approve as presented. We've got a motion to move to approve. Second. We've got a second. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Good to go. Granted. <laughs> That was really good. Let's see if we can do that again. <laughs> Next on the agenda. Get the applicant ready. Yes. All right, wonderful. Sure. Then we'll start off the right way with a summary of the request <laughs> from staff. Okay. Item number two is 2001. Yeah. Uh, parcel number 07 Gaines Pedro is uh, Gaines Pedro is uh, It's uh, Council District 2 to Costa Hastings. The applicant's request is the following. One, to fill a portion of the existing pond known as Bush Lake. Two, to abandon the existing zone one and zone two buffers around portions of Bush Lakes, uh, the portion that's being filled. Three, to fill the existing wetland along the edge of Bush Lake. Four, to abandon the existing wetland buffer along the wetland being filled. Five, to establish, reestablish a zone one and zone two buffer limit around the new limits of Bush Lake. Uh, six, to allow continuous mowing and maintenance within the zone one limits. And seven, to allow impervious services to be constructed in the new zone one and zone two limits. The appellant is the Giddens Group, LLC, being represented by Travis Todd of Thomas and Hutton. A stormwater staff, staff does not feel the additional site area should be created by filling community waters. Codes had no comments. Planning had no comments. Greenways will defer to the Stormwater Management Committee. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We will give the floor to the applicant for the opening statement. All right, I'm Travis Todd with Thomas and Hutton Engineering. Uh, we're representing uh, Peter Todd at the Giddings Group. Um, and we also have um, some other folks here in support um, that we can introduce in just a moment. Um, so this one's a little bit different. Um, so I'd like to kind of take a moment to explain the history of the body of water that we're uh, going to be impacting and requesting the variances for. And then we'll go from there. Um, can we put the aerial image back up, Rebecca? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that'll work right there. 
Um, maybe zoom out just a little bit if you can to get a little more of the Metro Center kind of perspective. So the, um, the body of water that's in question today is here on your screen. Uh, it's known as Bush Lake. It's about a two acre uh, man-made pond. Our site that we're developing is there outlined in yellow. Uh, this, this pond um, is a remnant body of water that was left over from a clay borrow pit that was dug in the early 1900s for the Bush, um, the W.G. Bush brick plant that used to sit in this area. The lake used to be about 40 acres, or the borrow pit was about 40 acres in size. Um, there were actually two. There was one across I-65 where the treatment plant sits today. There was one there as well, a borrow pit. So to extract clay from that um, to make bricks. And when that brick operation uh, ceased, that property was sold to another member of the, the Bush family. Um, and they backfilled the borrow pit with water to irrigate crops. And so that was kind of the history of how this lake came about. Then in the late 70s, with the Metro Center development, all but two acres of the lake were filled in. Um, to create a developable area for that portion of what's Metro Center today. And that's when um, the 60 acre uh, main lake that's in Metro Center um, was created. So this two acre body of water that we're talking about is really just a, a remnant leftover piece of a pond that's been filled and filled and filled over time. And it was really just left as kind of an amenity. It's not a stormwater management um, tool, it's, it's literally just a pond that has been left as a result of um, expanding development there. Um, it's not detention, it's not water quality, um, it is literally just a, a small amenity like there. As you'll see, the, the pond is totally private. Um, it's, it's on two parcels, the parcel line bisects the pond, the owners of the parcel to the north, uh, part, uh, uh, address 215 there are here with us today, um, the Stanton Group, and they are in support of the variances that we're requesting. They'd also like to see this pond um, change and be improved. So that's, that's the history of the body of water we're talking about, is that it's a man-made lake uh, that is currently not providing any stormwater management um, benefit at all. Today you see that there is a, a parking lot that she drains into the lake, um, the Hungry Fisherman restaurant, I don't know if anybody remembers that or, or went there when it was open, was perched out over the water. You can see that when that was demolished in the 90s, the remnant foundations are still there. There's still debris from that restaurant in the pond. Um, you've got concrete, you've got leftover uh, electrical works from a well that used to be there. There's a lot going on there and um, it's, a, it's a continual nuisance. Um, you have people that park in the lot that are really trespassing. Um, we've, we've been there and seen cars parked down the, in the tall weeds and shrubs. There's trash everywhere. Um, it's really a mess, and the current owners have no incentive to do anything about it. So without something being done, um, it will always remain that way in the, in the condition it's in. Um, I'll introduce um, Tony Grow in just a moment uh, with Grow Environmental Solutions. We've done some, uh, we've taken the oxygen levels in the pond, we've looked at the wildlife in the pond, and he'll speak to that in just a moment. Um, let me get to our, our proposal. Uh, Rebecca, if you can, let's see, uh, let's just, we'll go there, we'll go there for now. So what you see today on, on this exhibit, and it's a little, little grainy here, but we're going, the, the pond doesn't currently have buffers on it. Um, when we, once we come in with the development plan, we knew that buffers would be applied, and so that's why we're here before you today. There was a little bit of a question of whether we needed to be before the body since the buffers don't currently exist, but knowing when we come in from our grading permit, they would be applied. We wanted to go ahead and kind of get ahead of this. So what we're proposing, you'll see on the right side of your screen, um, there's a, a, a line vertical on the page, and that would be filling of the pond for about a quarter of an acre, a little less than a quarter of an acre of the two-acre pond. The reason we need to do this is because currently, and I'm going to step back and point, right here in this alignment is a, is a public sewer line with a 20-foot easement on it. To develop this parcel, we have to reroute that public sewer line, page right, up along the pond, and back in the access road um, there at the top of the page. So we're relocating that and to, in order to not lose developable area on the site, we need to push that, that pond limit in a little bit. And in exchange for that, we'd like to do a water quality project to improve this, this body of water. 
So we went ahead and assumed that the pond's got 10 foot zone one, 15 zone two buffer. There is a tiny portion of wetland here, which I think is less than a thousand square feet. We went ahead and assumed that that's got a 25 foot uh, buffer on it as well. We currently have permits in process with TDEC and the Corps. Um, TDEC is running this as a general ARAP and the Corps is running it as a nationwide. They consider this a de minimis impact and we should have those permits in hand within a week, I would assume, based on where we are in the comment with them. It's not going out for public comment period. Um, they were just running it through as de minimis impact. So essentially they are, at this point, until we get those approvals in hand, everything we've talked with them about is they are okay with what's happening here and what we're proposing. It, uh, we're staying under the core acre limit that TDEC uh, requires to run it as a general air app. So that, that is the impact to, to the pond. We're, and now if we could, Rebecca, if we could go to the illustrative uh, rendering, and I've got this on, on our, our sheet here as well. So you can see here, I, I printed this a little bit larger here because um, I didn't know what our situation would be today, but here's an aerial image of the way this exists today. And then on the right, um, could you go to the second page, Rebecca? This one right here. Um, this is what's being proposed. So this is a, a multifamily project. Um, you'll see that we're proposing an amenity area that would face the lake, Bush, Bush Lake. You can see the edge of the, of the fill there. So what we're proposing is a vertical wall, probably some sort of sheet pile wall um, with, with a top on it. We're proposing to amenitize the, the edge of the lake here, very similar to what we see in other places in Metro Center. We are proposing the sewer line to be relocated here. So our building is being held back enough to get the public sewer line rerouting through with a 20 foot easement. And then we're proposing um, to, there, there's invasive species um, all around in terms of plant life. We're proposing to clean that up and come back with new native species. We, on some of our, uh, on some of the mitigation um, plan elements, we are currently, have a TDU requirement of 15.7 TDUs. We're gonna be providing 39.2 TDUs. Um, so well above, more than double uh, what's required in terms of TDUs. We're proposing to add an aeration fountain, which you'll see here um, and on the rendering here. Um, the, the DO levels are very low in the pond and we wanna add that back so that we can really get aquatic and, and plant life um, going again. So um, we are proposing to fill, as you can see, I know there's a lot on the list in terms of the, the items that are being requested. What we would do here is after we fill, we would reestablish zone one and zone two buffers and allow for construction of the amenity area as you see, but we'd like for people to be able to enjoy this again. The comment from staff was that they did not feel like that additional areas should be gained by filling a community water. And I'll point out the additional area is mainly for the sewer realignment so that we can develop the property. And number two, we don't feel it's a community water today. Uh, it's not enjoyed by the community. If anything, we have to, you know, we're, we're, there are people are being run off daily um, because it's not a place that they should be currently, but we want to amenitize it so that it is a welcoming place for the community uh, where they can come back and enjoy this body of water again. So in our view, it's a, again, it's a man-made lake. This is a remnant piece of something that's been, fi been filled and filled and filled since the 70s. Um, it's not a community water today. Wildlife and oxygen levels are very low, invasive plant species all around. We'd like to, you know, for, for what we're requesting here and being able to not lose the developable land area to reroute the sewer, we're proposing to improve the water quality of the pond by doing what you see here. So we realize that we're filling a portion of the pond and that it's, it's getting smaller, but we think the, the, it's going to be improved in many ways. And so that, that's just an overview of, of what we're proposing. Again, I know that the list is, is long in terms of what we're requesting. Um, now we get that, we're not, we're not hiding that fact, but we, this is an opportunity for a water quality improvement project for Metro really on our, on our clients, um, on our clients' dime. Um, Peter, could I introduce you yes. real quick? Some, come say a word. It's Peter Kyle with the Giddings Group. Can I ask one question before you step away? Yes, Michael. Uh, the tension mm -hmm. as it relates to the pond. Uh -huh. Is it an isolated body of water? Does it have a discharge point? And how will it affect your tension? Sure. So it, it's it, it's water comes water comes in, water goes out. So it's got the only there's no stream that comes into this. It does have a few headwalls. 
here, here, and here, I believe, that come into the pond. Um, there is an outlet pipe set on the downstream end. I mean, it's, it's a big pipe with no weir or anything. I think it's a 24 inch and it's just set at an elevation. Um, and as soon as water comes in and that begins to, to fill that waters right back out. And this isn't part of the Metro Center canal system either. Part of that water quality, uh, the, the storage volume that was designed and calculated for Metro Center, this is not a part of that system. So this is water in, water out in this pond. It doesn't provide any detention storage. I think I should probably note that community water is actually our classification similar to waters of the state mm -hmm. and waters of the U.S. So it is a community water because it is a pond and it is a wetland and it was a stream as well. So that's just the way we sure. classify waters in Nashville. Sure. Understood. Peter, you want to say a little bit about your development next door in this one? Hey, y'all. I'm Peter Kyle with the Giddings Group. And uh, Travis was good asking earlier if he had <laughs> law degree, but uh, anyhow, we own the property next door just to the um, west as well. So we've seen this pond over the last four years and, and, and the parking lot really. I was out there last night just watching people and we've been kicking homeless people out from around the whole pond for the last four years and, um, and no one really, not kicking them out, but but having to call you know, police or whatnot on. But all this, this whole area right now around the pond, you can't even access the pond. We have 251 units next door. And none of the residents can even enjoy this area being next door. Um, so what we really want to do is improve this, which Travis didn't really show in his drawings, but with Stacy and the Stanton group, we met with them. We want to clean up the entire area of the pond as well for all the Metro Center to enjoy. So this would not be necessarily private right in here because there's no gates blocking it off so people can actually come and enjoy the area <clears throat> within metro center and they don't even know how many people work in there 12 to fifteen thousand, which is a big big gap but that's a lot of people that can enjoy this okay thank you tony do you want to come yeah. briefly talk about what you found I'm Tony Grove with Grove Environmental. Uh, this lake is kind of an unusual lake. Uh, when we first started looking at it, we went back and looked at the history of the lake. I'm sorry. Hey, you wanna yeah, that's all right. Lake. We started looking at the history of the lake, and we found out this lake had, you know, it's been built, constructed as a borrow pit. The water quality of that pond is pretty poor. We looked at the DO of the pond, and it's around three. And to sustain fish life, it's got to be between five or above. And so it's on the borderline. So we're talking about, uh, they were talking about aerating. I said, when we talked to the state, the state had no requirements as far as mitigation on the general permits. So this is something that um, they camp on their own, pod and, and, uh, and crew. So the fact that uh, putting aeration in the pond will actually increase the aquatic life, quality of life for this pond tremendously. Because um, when we did a fish survey, we think we had like 15 bass that were depleted as far as their, their health. And then the bass, uh, we had also bluegill, but they were all small size. Nothing was really substantially developed. So we think that this project will actually increase the quality of this lake. And then redoing the boundary of the lake and doing the uh, planting native vegetation is going to make a big, it's going to create a much better environment for the lake. So, thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks for your uh, consideration. Thank you. Uh, anyone here to speak uh, in favor of or in opposition to the uh, applicant's request? Would you like to say anything or? No. Uh, <laughs> All right. You're well, you're welcome to. Any anyone else here from the public to speak in favor of or uh, in opposition to? All right. Seeing none. With that will uh, turn to the panel for questions and discussion. Okay. I'm, I've got a couple of questions. Um, I've got one for you're the, you're the owner. Yes. Okay. And um, um, you, you, because this is classified as a community water. Uh, could you all guarantee that this space along the waterfront that you're going to be enhancing would be accessible to the public? Yes. Okay. I've been discussing that all along. Okay. All right. And then, uh, uh, secondly, um, um, 
I'm assuming, are, are you gonna do any other kind of enhance? I, I, I see a sidewalk that goes around the bottom and the far right-hand side, I'm assuming that's south and east. This here? Yep. Yeah, that's an existing sidewalk that okay. just that ends here. And on the north side, there's no sidewalk. Well, in the plan north, there's no sidewalk. That's just the common access road that okay. kind of loops through this area. Okay. So those can be those can be connected. Okay. Okay, then um, um, since I've been here long enough to remember other Metro Center uh, variances that we've granted and discussed, I'm just going to make a general comment. Um, this is a heavily uh, altered site from a hydrologic standpoint. Um, used to be floodplain to the Cumberland River. Now there's a federal levy that basically cuts off the Cumberland River uh, from influencing this floodplain anymore. Um, because of the, the nature of, of many of these ponds having a long history with going all the way back to horse race tracks that were there during the 19th century, all the way up to the factories that were there and, and now the current day Metro Center. Um, there's probably not a single natural water body on that entire site. Uh, I know we have granted variances. I have personally uh, voted for variances to do more than what you're proposing today. Um, um, I, I think because of your willingness to make uh, the shoreline next to your development available to the public and because of the enhancements that you're proposing to do for water quality and for the buffer. Um, this is a different kind of dynamic than we would normally, than I would normally feel comfortable supporting. Um, normally zone one is kind of a sacrosanct type of uh, uh, concern for us that we that we rarely grant intrusions into, uh, but our primary concern there are community waters that are natural or least disturbed is, is one term we've used in, in this field in the past. And uh, our primary goal is to try to enhance and protect and preserve uh, natural functions, uh, natural ecological functions, natural hydrological functions. This is a pretty unique circumstance. And so um, um, I feel comfortable supporting the variance just as a statement to share with my fellow uh, committee members. So, and I have a motion if there's no further discussion. I don't have any comment. What's your motion, Todd? <clears throat> to uh, uh, move to accept the variance as presented with the condition that the uh, uh, um, portion of the buffer that's closest to the uh, development site will be accessible to the public. I'll second your motion. A motion and a second. <clears throat> Any discussion on the motion? I hate to do this, but I don't know the way to make sure that's the case unless it's a greenway dot. Yeah. Just yeah. bring up that point. Yeah. That, that, yeah. And I only offer that that condition because it was suggested by the applicant. So. Right. All right, well, and, and because of staff's reference to this being a community water, I think they're very accurate about that. So. We've got a motion. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none, the motion is granted. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. Appreciate Thank it. You. All right. Oh, we've got our case. Still in there, the dang thing. All right, that was the last request on the agenda. Did we have any other items other than perhaps discussing this case? I've lost my agenda. All right, well, that's it. So the only item of uh, business is uh, this Precision Homes case. Was it an oral assessment of the case? <laughs> so I, I actually, uh, 
uh, had invited um, the litigator who principally handled this case, Ms. Kate Baum, with our office um, to join us this morning. And um, she is planning to be here. Um, I, I hate to drag this out in order to allow her to come. I know she had a conflict at 7.30 and was hoping to get over here as soon as that wrapped up. Um, so I, I think I was kind of anticipating that the first few matters would take a little bit longer than they actually did this morning. Um, and so in, in her defense, um, I'm sure she was relying on, on, um, on that assumption. Um, but um, I, I can kind of start going through it a little bit. And then if she gets here, she can and kind of add on to my thoughts because I think I just to explain a little bit kind of like how we do things in my office we do kind of divide up between um, litigators and client advice attorneys so I'm a client advice attorney we don't do litigation except at the civil service you know, like administrative level um, and some general sessions but um, like you know circuit court chancery court um, federal court that's all handled by our litigators and um, Kate is one of the litigators so you know we kind of try to keep our department clients from, you know, getting into litigation on the client advice side, and then when we fail, they take over. So um, uh, uh, in this case, though, I think the conclusion that you can draw from this decision is that we didn't fail, because I really feel like this decision is very positive for the um, uh, kind of um, ratifying the um, concepts that we've been following in terms of um, the decisions that this committee has been making. Um, uh, and um, it really does follow, I mean, so much of the things that we talk about um, as you all are addressing the cases that come before you um, on a regular basis. And it's, it's kind of nice to have some, like, court opinion authority um, to support um, what we have been um, talking about um, uh, because um, there's really not been a history of case law authority out of stormwater cases in the past. And so we have been, um, you know, following, you know, this committee's own rules and procedures and um, looking to, to federal guidance and um, um, looking to cases um, from the, the Board of Zoning Appeals, which it has more um, published opinions and also kind of has the same variance consideration process that, that you also often hear. Um, so um, uh, what's especially nice about this case is this is actually an appellate court level decision. So um, the case you may be from, I'm sure you're familiar with because it obviously came before you, but um, the um, Precision Homes case um, was some properties on Miami Avenue um, that came before the committee multiple times. Um, there were kind of efforts to maybe um, I guess negotiated a way to see if um, if there could be other um, resolutions like a land swap, and, and none of that panned out. Um, and so um, it came before the committee twice. Once upon rehearing, um, it failed um, four to two the first time, and then when it came before you again, the motion to approve failed by a three to three vote. So it is from that decision that it was appealed first to Chancery Court, um, and the Chancery Court um, decided against the appellant, um, against Precision Homes, um, and then it was appealed from there to the Tennessee Court of Appeals, and so that is the decision that you have before you, the decision of the Tennessee Court of Appeals in this matter. Um, so um, in general, one of the things it talks about that um, that I think is really important for you all to understand, and I think you do have a good understanding of, and we've certainly talked about it before, but it, it always bears repeating, is, is what is your standard of review? So the discussion of that kind of starts at the bottom of page two of the opinion. And um, it talks about um, that you actually have a lot of deference to your decision that the courts give you. Um, uh, they will not overturn a decision of a committee like yours, um, unless it is arbitrary and capricious 
and not supported at all by material evidence. Um, so that is what they are looking for when they are reviewing a decision of a board or commission like this. Um, they are looking to make sure that it is not arbitrary and capricious and to make sure um, that there, there is actually evidence in the record that, that would um, support um, what is being reviewed. And fortuitously, here is Kate. <laughs> we just started discussing the case, Kate. You, you want to come around? Sure. So I want to introduce you all to Kate Fahm, who, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the litigators in our office and um, the person who principally handled um, the um, Decision Homes case. And um, I was just going over the standard of review, and I haven't right. gotten any further than that. Oh, well, perfect. That's the most exciting part. <laughs> um, so did you go over the standard of review? Yes. Okay. Um, so. I don't know if you all have any particular questions, of course, just interrupt me, um, but uh, we're very pleased with the decision. I think it's very good for um, the committee because what it does is give us sort of, I think Ms. Costones had been very well interpreting the law. She was interpreting the law, but we didn't have any stormwater committee decisions in mm -hmm. Tennessee at all. So this is the first one, and now what we have is this understanding of what is an appropriate way to look at a variance request. Um, so we had, I'm going to use my copy because yeah. I looked at it. Um, we had, of course, pointed them to the actual stormwater regulations and all of that. Um, and one of the things that we argued, which I think um, Ms. Costones has said to you multiple times, is that these regulations align with um, FEMA regulations and that it's appropriate to use sort of FEMA's interpretations of those regulations as guidance. And the court uh, agreed with that. They said that was um, appropriate, um, especially given the fact that FEMA's regulations sort of also align with um, land use variance requests and the same sort mm -hmm. of um, uh, standard that is used in that. And specifically, the language of like, you have to have good and sufficient cause, exceptional hardship. Um, and so, the court talked about um, how an exceptional hardship and go to sufficient cause cannot be based upon the personal difficulties of an owner. It has to be related to the property itself. We're talking about topographical differences, um, things like that. Um, and I think uh, that that is what you all applied at this hearing, but they have affirmed that that is the right way of doing things, which is perfect. Um, they, let's see what else. Um, that it cannot be just pecuniary loss. Oh, yes. So it can't be, it really ties in with the way that these things are looked at um, when we talk about land use and the Board of Zoning Appeals. So if we, if I think what's great is that we can, what the court has said is we can really look at that type of law for these types of requests too. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at is um, it has to be a hardship that is re so, a, a related to an exceptional, unusual, um, and specific circumstances related to the property, this specific property. So something that would not change, not based on the owner who happens to own it, not based on what he wants to do with the property. Um, and, and that's not common in other property properties. Also. Exactly. Yeah. So that is that is the Sorry. standard language that you'll see in variance law out there um, in Tennessee, um, and that applies as well in stormwater positions. And I think, in fact, FEMA goes a little bit farther even than we see in um, variance because we're looking at public safety issues uh, um, that are a little bit more concerning than maybe some of the general land use issues. So, um, law, please. Oh, pecuniary loss, meaning financial money. loss. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. you can't okay. say that um, I'm not going to be able to make any money on this parcel because of this, and that's my hardship. That is not a hardship so under pecuniary loss. Yes. Okay. I thought, yeah. thought you said so law. If, yeah. Okay. No, I'm okay. sorry. Loss. Pecuniary loss. Um, uh, so it, the specific quote from the BZA case was. Um, 
It is the peculiar circumstances of the land that must be the primary consideration rather than the hardship personal to or created by the owner of it. And then it further says, the case for a variance here is made even weaker by a lack of evidence of hardship other than the pecuniary loss, the financial loss, which has been held insufficient itself to justify a variance. So I don't know if you all remember in this case, um, and I think probably in a lot of cases, what the um, property owner was saying was, I won't be able to develop the property um, the way I want to. It's it's going to be worthless. Um, that is not. They still hear this from time to yes, time. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> that is not an. Ex that's so, not an extreme hardship under the law. Exception. The plaintiff claim was that we we made a bad decision. Not it was a taking. No, they did not bring a takings case. Um, they so when. So people, if they're going to bring a takings case, gen the way that's generally going to come up is in a totally separate lawsuit, not an appeal from your board. Yeah, it's, it was a writ of search. Right. And this was a writ of search, which is an appeal from the board's decision. So and can, so, can they bring a takings in the, in the appeal? You can't. We don't think so. No, you can't combine. Why a, wouldn't they just say that it was a constitutional violation? The decision. They can't do that. Like people. Um, like a, a regulatory taking that yeah, it was. Why could, yeah, why couldn't you say that based on constitutional? Like, I think we're getting too deep. This no, that's okay. Because what y'all are talking about is really what is important to the panel, regardless of what decision we make. Um, but why wouldn't they just challenge it as a taking? So, it's an uncompensated taking. I think that's a, I think that's a reasonable question. I, I can answer that if you. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, so, I mean, the taking, if one occurred, yeah. would have been when the buffer was first enacted in 1999 and not when you all granted or failed to grant a variance from that buffer. So they would not be making that argument when they should have if they were to so bring that up now. They have a statutory uh like they, so they'd be barred by statute. I think to that there would be a even statute. Though they don't, it doesn't apply until they find out. So the way takings works is a regulatory takings is that the taking occurs when the property, uh, when the regulation is placed on the property, if there is a taking. And so in this case, if you're going to claim that the buffer was a taking, that happened in 1999 when the buffer regulations were put in on, on the property. And well, they're not until they develop it. Well, that's not how it works. For taking, it doesn't matter what the property owner wants to do with the property, it's when did the value of the property disappear. So when the value of the property became nothing, if you're going to argue that the buffer regulations create the, this problem, it's when the buffer regulations were put on the property, not when this particular owner decided to do something. So the statute of limitations would apply, and there's um, a one-year statute of limitations from that um, taking. So. And, and in this case, there's also a combination. It's not just the stormwater regulations that are at issue. You also have the setback variance, uh, setback issue from um, just regular zoning code. So those two things together are what caused these prop this property to be um, to have no developable, developable. Yeah. Um, envelope. I guess is how they say it. Just a fine point, but I'm and I, I'm not an attorney, but I, I uh, in my land use law classes in graduate school and planning school, uh, I learned that takings, as defined by the Supreme Court, were fundamentally a um, when takings are found to be uh, uh, reasonable, that it's essentially a taking of all reasonable economic uses of the property. So one of the economic uses that we explored for this particular applicant was Metro buying the property at a lower than development value, which to me is consistent with the Supreme Court's finding that there are reasonable uses, reasonable economic opportunities. They're just not the ones that the applicant desired. That's probably and, what we would have argued if they brought a regulatory takings in so I before I want to make 2000. that point. That, you know, I understand what you're saying. You're saying it had no, it had zero development value, but that doesn't mean it has no economic value. And when I say that, I'm not saying that it has zero development value. I'm saying if we assume that to be the case, right, then right. the taking had to occur uh, in 1999 when the regulations were put in place. No one is ever sure entitled to yes. a variance. I am, I'm, I'm, we, we're working on a case right now that is an actual regulatory taking case that is not related to the 
to this property, but a different property, and it is that is so the law. Like the, the statute itself can be constitutionally valid because it allows variances. I mean, that, that's the reason why you can even have a, a constitutionally valid. Nobody is because, is. is because the applicants are able to get a variance. And so what you're saying is, though, that if they don't, <laughs> that we don't have to actually grant any of the variances. And, well, and then they lose their opportunity to challenge so, the statute. So they have the burden to seek a variance. Um, you know, that you, no one is entitled to a variance. Um, uh, so you shouldn't um, invest in property assuming that you're going to get a variance um, sure. because that's an a, a incorrect assumption. I mean, it, it, the burden is going to be on you to prove that you do meet that exceptional hardship and good and sufficient cause um, criteria. And also, you know, it, the other criteria that we end up looking at a lot um, with this committee is that, that the development is the minimum necessary to provide yourself with a buildable area. Um, so, um, uh, you know, you, you can't really have a taking from a failure to grant a variance because you're really not, like, entitled to the There's variance no right to, to begin variance. with. The other thing to keep in mind is um, even if you might say that the taking didn't occur in 1999 maybe because they didn't know that the property had lost all its value at that point, in 2000, in 2000 yeah, in 2010, um, after the flood, the we the law changed so that there were no variances from building in the flood way, and that is really where a lot of these property values changed along the Cumberland because that is the before they could have gotten a variance to build into the flood way, of course, and so they had a lot of this buildable area potentially if they got a variance. But once we said you can't build in the flood way, for sure, no variance. That's what created a teeny tiny envelope for these individuals. And there, there were a couple of different changes. Like after the 2010 flood, um, uh, Councilman Jernigan um, sponsored legislation about not being able to build in the floodway at all. And then more recently, Councilman Syracuse yes. um, uh, passed an additional bill that makes the buffer on the Cumberland River for purposes of residential development um, a um, like a part of the metro code itself as opposed to a part of the um, stormwater regulations. Now this committee grants variances from the provisions of the stormwater regulations but not from provisions of the metropolitan code itself. Council has to change the metropolitan code if they want to deviate from what they have said in the past. So um, uh, by, making, by making that buffer in those circumstances a part of the Metropolitan Code itself adopted by ordinance by council, um, basically that became something that this committee no longer had the authority to grant a variance from. Which would apply in this case if it had happened but it didn't more in this case, but we, we now it would if you were going forward. Potential other cases coming down the pike where yes. that may be an issue. So ultimately, um, they did not make a regulatory takings. They may have mentioned regulatory takings or something like that, but they did not make the claim. It, it came up during our they, yeah, debate. I mean, they did not um, perfect that claim before the court. Um, I, I don't remember. Whether they could or couldn't have, that's not what was discussed. Yes, and they so, did not yeah. bring it. And it sounds like what was discussed is what, how we're supposed to make our decision. Yeah. That yes, was, and, um, it was, it was you know, they talked a lot about... Um, at the Court of Appeals level, not at the trial court really, if I remember correctly, there was some more discussion about the individual board members' comments. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> I, I just, I do think that's unusual, and I think the law is pretty clear that that's not how we do things. We don't look at, we don't, unless, unless one of you had actually said, I am going to vote to grant this variance and then immediately turned around and voted not to grant the variance. You, you have to have a really clear problem before we look at individuals' comments. Um, so uh, the court looked at that but basically uh, tossed it away. Um, and then uh, the I did think one of the big things we argued was that one of the big reasons why this didn't meet the variance standard was that that there was this risk um, of flooding yeah. and um, the court uh, 
thought that was an appropriate basis for denying the variance. And so I think that's also important to note that um, the, the public safety issue of having additional homes in this area was an appropriate reason to deny the variance. Yeah, in terms of the discussion of the individual comments of the individual board members, what um, kind of um, uh, impressed me about that section of the decision was the degree to which they related that back to the factors that we um, the factors listed on page four that um, are in your internal rules and procedures um, that you all reference back. Um, so they were really looking, what they're really looking at is there any evidence to the in the record to support that any of those issues apply? Yeah. And if yeah. so, could you then have based your conclusion on like a logical yeah. inference from that? Or conversely, something that was arbitrary and capricious, mm -hmm. which is basically means it's not part of your rulemaking, mm -hmm. decision-making process. And um, that you and then Chairman Wagner had looked at the issue of the safety of um, uh, emergency responder personnel um, in the event of flooding and needing to rescue people um, from those locations um, was is on that list and was one of the things that the court picked out as something that um, they specifically said the safety of first responders is a valid consideration mm -hmm. under your stormwater regulations. Mm -hmm. And um, also uh, this, I mean, very strong language saying the burden of proof was on precision to, however, to justify its entitlement to the variance. So that's, that the court really sets, makes it clear that this is a very high bar. You use the word entitlement, does it say entitlement? They have to justify their entitlement to the variance. Yes, yes. meaning what that means is that yeah. the burden is always going to be on the applicant, right. and that they have to show that they meet every single one of these considerations, all, all of the, um, and then you all have a lot of power because you have the. Yes, you have the uh, standards for granting a variance, where you have to see that it's uh, the variance is the minimum necessary considering the flood hazard. There's a showing of good and sufficient cause. You have all of these things you're supposed to do first, but you also have all of these considerations right. that I mean, there's a very very. Was this, was this the main position of the plaintiff in the trial? Which? That that we just didn't that we that we stepped outside of our authority in our decision. The, that it has to be it has because to. the standard of review on a writ of start is. So this is what they were left with. Arbitrary and capricious standard. And they appealed that point. Yes. So they essentially were saying that your um, the board's concerns about flooding were irrational. That's what they were trying to argue. And they were trying oh, to because it was so high up, so it wasn't going to be really flooding. That's so what they were trying rational. to say, was that so, the proof was that it was so high that there was no real actual flooding risk and that the board was just irrational in thinking that. And the court said, no, okay. that's not irrational. It's totally relevant. The fact that we're looking at the safety of um, uh, first responders, looking at the 2010 flood and what happened at that time is not inappropriate. Um, so, uh, it, I mean, it's a very good decision. Yeah. And they didn't try to make any of the arguments that we applied, that we applied the regulations and the variances different to this case than other cases? They actually did, um, but that is a very difficult thing to do. So the law is that we, when we're up on appeal, we only look at this case. We're not pick, looking at other cases because the court doesn't have those other cases in front of them. So they tried to bring in additional evidence of other cases that were before the board, um, and the court rejected that. But what I can tell you is, from what I saw, can I, can I just add? Yeah. Because Kate did a fantastic job of becoming familiar with all of those cases and distinguishing them. And um, in trying this case, she's become kind of an expert in stormwater law, well, no, no. and uh, we're very glad to have her have that expertise yes. to the extent we get more cases. You're going to get an invitation to my class. Um, I, mean, I do want to say that she did such a great job. So they made that argument, but then we, with a lot of help from Stormwater staff, I looked at all of the cases yeah. that they were trying to bring. I remember that report. Yeah. And not, 
from none of them fit this scenario. There was there were times that you all ran variances that um, maybe you could argue shouldn't have been granted uh, based on the the rule. But what I found was that um, there were no situations like this where we had a property that was. Everything exactly Ran the same. full, and yeah. there was nothing where we were doing full new construction in the buffer, in the zone two buffer. And that's what this was. Like, and the, the entire building envelope was going to be in the buffer. It was brand new construction. There was nothing like that that you had approved. And the only thing that was like it had actually just been rejected. Yeah, I remember that one. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Does any of this have to do with the, the time of purchase, the date of purchase of this property relative to when the buffer regulation went into effect? Because he bought this property in 2004, and the buffer regulation went into effect in 1990. I remember that coming up. Um, we pointed that out, um, but, and I didn't really know this, and I think it, it, it didn't really. Apparently, uh, the, the property owner, the court didn't really att attach any significance to that, at least in this particular situation, and that could have been due to the fact that apparently the facts were that, um, I think it's Mr. Smith, when he purchased the property, he actually secured variances on all four parcels that he purchased before he purchased them and then um, only went forward and developed one of those parcels, and that's the one that flooded and, and we bought. Yes. Um, so he had actually purchased them with variances in place, but those variances, uh, the, the three remaining variances obviously expired. So he never developed them. But for um, there were many other parcel owners, property owners who owned property before the buffer ordinance was enacted, who were not grandfathered in because they owned it before. They were regulated after the fact. Yes, right? If they had wanted to make some sort of argument that that was a you know a taking of their property, they would have had to done. They'd have to done it within the, the year. Okay. Okay. Can I ask some questions about the evidentiary? comments here. I, uh, I, I think this may help us more than anything. Um, um, I don't remember explicit evidence being presented that relates to some of the court's arguments for supporting some of the statements that were made based on evidentiary evidence. And by, by explicit, I mean a written document. You know, there are references to research in some of these quotes, or there are references to document. Okay, okay, that, that's what I wanted to clarify because um, uh, one thing I didn't touch on in the second case that was just before us was that um, uh, they and previous applicants routinely. Um, uh, not everybody, but routinely will make an argument that the court said this or the state said that. And one of our policies in, in the past, one of our uh, uh, informal policies in the, in the past has been to ask for an email, a letter from the core of the state to verify that they see this as a de minimis impact or that they've granted a permit. And typically, we prefer not to have just verbal testimony in those types of, of sort of higher level um, regulations supporting evidences. So basically what you're telling me here is that verbal testimony is enough, but if we want to up the ante and, as a board and, and, and formally require or, or through a, a, a majority vote ask for specific proofs of, of written evidence, um, you know, clear documentation, narrative evidence, um, that we can do that, but we don't necessarily have to do that. Is that, is that what you're saying? I, I, I agree. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, the the idea that um, the standard of review is so high yeah. Yeah, I was and thinking so difficult that it, okay. it really okay. should not, um, I would not let it influence how you um, make your decisions. You would not let what, I wouldn't what? have that influence your, how, you would not what let kind of evidence you want to, like what level of evidence Whether you written or okay. appropriate. Because yeah. essentially the court is not looking at it the way you look at it. Okay. They're, they're specifically saying, we're not gonna step into the shoes of the board. We're only gonna look at whether there is 
you know, just some amount of evidence yeah. that reasonably yeah. supports that the you decision. can trace back from a verbal comment Versus, to Versus, of course, you as records. a board should be looking for more than that. Okay. Right? Okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, yeah. There, that's, that, is a stand, that is a standard of review once we get up. But of okay. course, you as a board are supposed to be determining um, whether the applicant has made, met their burden okay. based on the evidence in front of you. And so okay. if you don't think that the, uh, the, someone just saying, well, I did get that approval is enough, um, and you would want a written document, that's entirely appropriate. Um, okay. Okay. Now, if we went up on appeal, I can rely on that, that, that statement that they made okay. if we have to. Okay. But it's obviously you want to do the best work you possibly can and have okay. the best record you possibly okay. can. And in, in this decision, this language isn't mentioned, but in um, other case law um, arising out of the, the, the writ of cert appeal process, um, the standard is also characterized as um, requiring that you must find more than a scintilla of evidence. Um, and a scintilla is obviously a very small mark. So as, as Kate is saying, really, you know, y you want to have more evidence than a scintilla um, uh, for, for what you actually base your decision on. In theory, your decision could be upheld as long as you just or jot over that scintilla quantity, whatever that is. So. They're really looking to just make sure you haven't made a decision that's completely arbitrary yeah. and has no basis in any evidence. That's really all they're looking for versus, of course, your job is different. Your job is to actually weigh the evidence and determine whether which which is the right decision. Okay. Yeah. I, I, if, if it, if it um, the board give me a little more latitude, I know we're taking a valuable time. I just want to make four comments about some conclusions I'm drawing from this. One, um, I specifically remember you uh, coaching us through this and saying, follow your procedures and reference your decisions back to the criteria that you're supposed to make these decisions by. I also specifically remember you telling us that we couldn't hang our hat on unrelated non-stormwater uh, court precedents, but that that could inform our understanding of what hardship was. And now the court, I think, has affirmed your interpretation that way. Um, and then secondly, I specifically remember Roger being very articulate about um, uh, flooding and flood impacts uh, and other aspects and, and, and taking a, a uh, um, a role in, in submitting information that the board needed to make a, a proper decision um, based upon um, engineering data, uh, weather data, flood data. Um, and then lastly, I, I remember the stormwater staff assembling an extremely professional matrix comparing previous um, committee decisions that it just blew me away. It was it was graduate school level and beyond quality work, and um, I, I just want to say how impressed I am with the professionalism of Metro staff. So. And you got that same professionalism in this. And, and my fourth comment <laughs> was that uh, I really appreciate you stepping up and 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 making this something that. Uh, Will help us make more objective decisions yeah, in the past. It's good to yeah, I, yeah. I really think we're very pleased with that. Yeah. Were there any uh, <coughs> summary judgment motions in the trial? Uh, no, they wouldn't be appropriate under the standard. They they can't bring a summary you judgment. You want emailing me the trial briefs and the appellate briefs? Can you do that? Sure, we can do that. Yes. I just yes. want to see those two bridges. So, in other words, there's no other briefing. Other um, there were some motions because they they filed some motions to you know supplement the record. Like I, I said earlier, they wanted to bring in other evidence. So there were some motions and replies. Motions and limiting and stuff. Um, they were motion. Well, they were right. simply just um, motion to supplement the record because a, a uh, common law writ of yeah, cert. Yeah, I don't the, care about that. The way it works, the common law writ of cert is there is really nothing other than uh, the record submitted, my brief, his brief, right. maybe a reply brief on his side, and then the trial court's decision. Yeah. So if, if you want the briefing and the, I can send you the trial court's order as well if you'd like. Uh, you might already have that, I'm sure you do. Mm -hmm. We, probably, have we may order. have circulated it at the time. Uh, I don't have the bottom, sure yeah, so the bottom order is the two, the two appellate briefs and then the trial brief would be great. 
I can do that. Thank you. And I'd love an electronic copy of this. You can do that. You can just, I'll send you everything. Okay. And I'll leave out the boring. Okay. Okay. They may not want any of it. <laughs> it's very interesting. We're, we're the geeks. So, yeah, we uh, and, we and, love this uh, stuff. You, I don't remember, but there were some references to regulatory takings in some of their briefings. So you can see. I'm, I'm actually very surprised that this is what they brought and they took it to because I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to challenge our decision. The yeah. deference that we're given is, is, is. And they made a very valiant effort. Now, I will yeah. say, you yeah. know, not, I mean, courts are. Um, not always going to uphold the decisions of boards and commissions. Oh, yeah. I mean, we have had decisions have from boards and commissions, despite that arbitrary and capricious, oh, yeah. you know, more than a scintilla of evidence we lose. Under where we have lost. Yeah. Yeah. So part of this was you all did your job right. Yes, yeah. that's, actually, that's absolutely true. Four long meetings. And a thousand page record. <laughs> yeah, she had a lot of was it really? The record? I think it was five volumes. Maybe more than that. It was, it was like uh, bringing it to court was interesting. You're going to be at every Stormwater conference from now on. They, they, trans so. they trans trans transcribed the video. Was that how yeah, they so, um, I think oh, yeah. the first meeting we actually didn't have a video. It was still when you all were uh, just audio. But yeah. the, the yeah. other four, we have someone transcribe the, the audio or video. They even have me stuttering on page. <laughs> I said, I, I, I. That sounds like I was talking to my wife. Yeah. We just had a first of the meetings relevant to the case, but still, it, it, when there's four meetings, it's a, it's a lot it's of information. Honey, I'm, I, I, yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, that's, that's always kind of interesting to me because there's also a lot of case law that says that a board or commission speaks only through its minutes. Yeah. Um, so it's always interesting to me that they oh, do no. the, yeah. require the transcription yeah. of the video. Yeah. And um, yeah. I know. Metro 3 always takes the position that you all are not the formal record of the proceedings <laughs> that occurs in these meetings yeah. because, and that is consistent with the law. It's consistent with legislative It is yeah. some evidence. Reviews. And so it is, you know, just kind of like, I think, too tempting to, to not yeah. look at. Yeah. So the yeah. court will. We also. So the video is not formal. Ev is not a formal evidence. record, but it, but it's evidence. We so. always yeah. now in details. every single administrative record when we prepare them because our office prepares those with assistance from the staff. So we prepare them, and on the cover page, we actually have provide a link to the YouTube video if there is one for that board, um, so that the court might be able to watch. So I would prefer to watch it rather than read it. I'd like to do both, honestly. So we, we do that for the court, but it's not a officially part of the record. But I would still say that the thoughtful and careful review of the minutes and decision letters is, is really important because that is the real official record of what actually Well, that's what's communicated to the applicant, for sure. Yeah. Was any of the video shown to the, uh, was shown to the bottom? Let me see if I remember. I, I don't know. None of the videos. I, I don't think so. I, there was some, I think we were, they were trying to put the meeting that happened after all of these decisions where you all had the presentation from staff about all of the different variance requests. They tried to put that video in or, um, and that did not happen, but um, I watched it. <laughs> yeah. I watched it and learned a lot. So, um, is there any chance this will be appealed higher? No, it has okay. now been. We got the mandate from the court. They did not. They had sixty days to do that from the date this was issued, and that has run. So they might go for the takings next, or not? Well, yeah. According to the statute, it's present. Yeah. The reference to the ability to rely on FEMA regulations goes to the, the Federal Register. I, I so it's not, they don't say you have the ability to rely on it. What they say is it's um, persuasive. So it's not actually applicable to the situation. Okay. It's just that because the language used in those, um, the net, it's really guidance, FEMA guidance, is interpreting regulations that are so similar in wording in terms of good and sufficient cause and um, exceptional hardship. You know, it has the exact same language. So they're saying that 
FEMA's um, kind of guidance, interpretation of those regulations, CFR regulations, that uses that exact same language is, is persuasive. It's, it's like, you know, it's logical that we would follow the same interpretation that they did, even though those specific regulations weren't applicable. What the court said specifically was that we agree with precision that the FEMA variance provisions cited by Metro do not apply to the present case. The variance provisions in these federal regulations, however, is essentially the same as the variance provision in Metro's stormwater regulations. Both provisions require a showing of good and sufficient cause, exceptional hardship. Um, in this circumstance where the parties have cited no other source to define these terms, because they're not defined in your regulations, we will consider the authority offered by Metro as to FEMA's interpretation of the terms. And at the end of that, when they went through the FEMA regulations, they said overall the FEMA guidance is similar to the Tennessee case law in that the emphasis is on the peculiar characteristics of the property itself and not upon the personal circumstances of the property owner. So yeah. they did find it to be um, not, it doesn't directly apply, that it's, but it is um, persuasive. Um, that So when we look at that, we, we can use those same, the same sorts of standards that FEMA does because it fits with Tennessee case law and it, and it, it even though that language. Tennessee case law arises from the BZA appeal context and not the stormwater appeal context, um, the fact that those two from those two different sources were coming off of basically the same language and reached the same conclusion about what it meant exactly. was like really persuasive to how we in this committee interpret that language as well as it applies to us. And that, fortunately, was how we had been doing it all along. It's good. It's very. <laughs> it's, it's very. It's very good yeah. evidence that their position was reasonable. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I know that a lot of municipalities' ordinances are based on model ordinances that come from those, the the CO, the, for, the federal register. Uh, and, yeah. and And I know that in my conversations with the national floodplain organizations that. That you know the the 40, 44 CFR sixty point three that defines the national flood insurance program is you know is, is a twenty plus year old document and because of the the challenges of modifying those guys, they just never get modified once they're once they're codified once they're part of the federal register they just they never change the FEMA then has hundreds of guidance documents that provide inordinate amounts of explicit detail about how to regulate based on what that 40 CFR defines. And we rely on them extensively because it's just good, it's just, yeah. it's just good basic guidance on and how to do And I think it's not that. a coincidence that similarity, Roger. I, mean, I wasn't around when um, your, you know, when, when um, Appendix F was drafted, but I'm sure that it was drafted based on, you know, federal model. I mean, it is the same exact language. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the court was looking at, we cited to, uh, but, uh, I guess they're FEMA bulletins. Those, that's what the we cited to. Technical bulletins, yes. Yeah, we cited to those for um, sort of an understanding of what this language means, and the court said that was appropriate to look at. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I appreciate you coming in. Thank you for coming. It's always fun. Move to adjourn. <laughs> All right. There's some super You got a second? Motion. I'll second the motion to adjourn. Any discussion on the motion? Saying none, all in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 Any opposed? We're done. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.